Hi, I'm Saskia. I'm a psychological wellbeing practitioner at Private Therapy Clinic. And in this video, I'm gonna be exploring the criticisms of Milgram's research. So if you don't know what Milgram's experiments were, especially the original experiment, I encourage you to watch my other video. Um, that video will explain the, the experiments, uh, the conclusions that are drawn from them, um, and just, yeah, the context of it as well. So please watch that video first before watching this one, because in this video, I'm gonna go into the criticisms surrounding those experiments. So uh, particularly the methodological concerns, the ethical questions, and just the criticism of the conclusions and their interpretations as a whole. Uh, so yeah, please watch that other video first if you haven't already. And now I'm gonna talk about why we should criticize that research. <laughs> Psychologist Gina Perry suggests that much of what we think we know about Milgram's experiments is only part of the story. So researching, while she was researching for her book in 2013, she stumbled across hundreds of audio tapes in the Yale archives, which documented numerous, numerous variations of Milgram's experiments. And she found some glaring issues in Milgram's data. She, among her accusations was that the supervisors went off script in their prods to the volunteers, the teachers. Um, she, suge she suggested that some of the teachers knew that the setup was a hoax. Um, and she also raised the issue that many of the participants were not fully debriefed on the purpose of the experiment, the true purpose, until months and months later, some years, uh, with some even remaining confused as to the true purpose of the experiment to this very day. Uh, so Gina's kind of main issue is that methodologically there are so many issues with Milgram's research that we have to really start re-examining the textbook descriptions of his research and also therefore their conclusions. While Milgram reported his process to be full of methodical and uniform procedures, the audio tapes actually suggest something quite different. During the experimental sessions, the experimenters often went off script uh, and coerced the subjects into continuing the electrical shocks. Perry suggests that this kind of obedience that we've come to associate with the Milgram experiments actually comes to sound a lot more like bullying and coercion when you listen to the audio tapes. Therefore, one of the questions raised is whether we can really say that his experiments were measuring obedience and the power of authority, because it could actually be measuring more like submission and persuasion. Uh, so one of the things that you can actually, you can look for yourself. So one of the most famous clips of the Milgram's research, uh, you can have a look at it and see this example of coercion. So it's not so much the bullying side that, that Perry suggests, uh, but it has like this, it's one of the, the original participants, one of the New Haven guys, and he is becoming quite agitated. He's seen that the learner is no longer responding. And he's saying to the experimenter, look, he was, I don't want, I can't do this. He's, he was hollering before and now he's not hollering. He could be dead in there. Um, who's gonna be responsible for this? I'm, I don't wanna be responsible for this. And instead of using one of the four prompts, the supervisor, the experimenter says, I will be responsible. I'll be responsible for this, please continue. So although that's not the bullying that Perry suggests in that particular example, there are, you can look for the recordings yourself of those bullying examples, uh, but even the, one of the most famous clips of the Milgram experiment shows how the experimenters could often go off script and not use those four original prompts and therefore have examples of coercion rather than just the kind of blind obedience that is suggested. So even before Perry's discovery of the audio tapes in the Yale archives, Milgram's studies have long been source of controversy and, and criticism. And this is because from the get-go, the ethics of the experiment were highly dubious because participants were subjected to psychological and emotional distress. Uh, so Milgram did suggest that his, all of his participants were de-hoaxed after the original experiment. Um, we now call this debriefing. And he also said that after, like a while after the experiments finished, he went back to each of the participants and, and questioned them, finding that 84% of them were glad to have taken part in the experiments with only 1% regretting their involvement. Uh, so the rest of them were neutral. They didn't care either way or the other. 
Uh, however, Perry went and interviewed these participants again, and out of the 700 or so participants who participated in the various variations of um, Milgram's research, she found that very few of them were truly debriefed. Uh, and a true debrief would have involved explaining that the shocks weren't real, um, that the learner was unharmed because they were a confederate, they were an actor. Um, but instead, Milgram's debrief sessions and de-hoaxing sessions mainly involved calming the participant down, uh, something he was said to have well, who reported to have said to a lot of the participants in these debriefs were, you've done a great thing for science. Like, you have really contributed to scientific discovery today. Congratulations. Um, rather than actually explaining that the shocks weren't real. Uh, so, regardless of his efforts to calm them down, many of the, his participants still left in a considerable state of distress. And this was found by Perry after when she in, interviewed them all. Um, she also found that while the truth was sometimes revealed in the original de-hoaxing of Milgram, uh, sometimes the truth was not revealed for months later, sometimes the truth was not revealed for years later, and some of them were never told the truth. So many participants still are confused about the real purpose of that experiment to this day. Um, so yeah, this is kind of raises some of the real ethical questions of M Milgram's research, uh, and, and it is important to investigate it but it's also important to recognize that these are the things that still shape psychological uh, psychological research and experiments to this day uh, so we know now what kind of not to do from things like Milgram's research. So another methodological issue which may seem quite simple um, but is important to recognize is the sample was all male uh, so all of the volunteers were in Milgram's experiments were male um, and they were also from New Haven. Uh, so this is a town, a small town in America. And it was, Milgram did suggest that he chose this town because it was very, very representative of America at that time. Um, but we can kind of recognise that as not very true, especially during the 60s. Um, there was a lot of segregation, so there was pretty much no, there was pretty much a fully white sample um, again it was all men so it can't be representative of females it can't be representative of different cultures uh, of different races uh, again when I talked about culture I mean it was done in America which is an individualist western culture um, it probably won't be representative of maybe some eastern cultures and their views on obedience uh, so yeah we have to be very careful when analyzing the conclusions drawn from Milgram's research because it's not a very representative sample at all, even though at the time they suggested it was. Um, so yeah, we have to be very wary of the conclusions drawn um, and who we're drawing those conclusions to. So more recent research has suggested that while people do tend to obey authority figures, the process isn't quite as cut and dry as Milgram depicted it. So researchers Alex Haslam and Stephen Riker have suggested that the, the degree to which people are willing to obey questionable orders from an authority figure depends on not only the situational uh, factors highlighted by Milgram in his studies, but it also largely depends on two internal key factors. And so that is how much the individual agrees with the orders given by the authority figure and also how much the individual identifies with the authority figure, so that legitimate authority figure. And while it's clear that people are far more susceptible to kind of authority, influence, persuasion um, and obedience than we would often like them to be, uh, then far from mindless machines that are just taking orders, it's important to recognise that there are internal factors as well. Uh, so therefore, it's important to remember that the Milgram's experiments may not just be measuring obedience levels, they could also be measuring those internal kind of key factors of how much the individual is identifying with the um, the authority figure, how much they're agreeing with the orders. Um, so so I'm going to give a couple of examples of and explore that in like interpretation a little bit more now. And I'm going to kind of go back onto the other video as well and use an example from there.
The suggestion that Milgram's experiments may not have just been measuring obedience, but unknowingly also measuring in more internal factors, for example, how much the participant identifies with the person giving the orders or their ideology, is actually made more likely by the fact that Milgram's sample was self-selected. Now, Milgram's sample only became participants because they decided to respond to a newspaper advert. And this because not all newspaper readers responded to the advert, this could mean that the participants already shared an ideology, uh, potentially something like it's important to become a participant of a scientific experiment because science is important and the pursuit of science is important, something like that. Um, so it can't be ruled out that the volunteer sample could have already had a higher chance of identifying with the experiment, the orders and the authority figure, the experimenter themselves. And this suggestion is furthered even more because it was found that the prompt that relates to kind of the experiment more um, and that was the most successful was the experiment requires that you continue. So that was the most successful prompt, whereas the least successful prompt and the prompt that actually caused more people to stop um, the experiment then rather than continue was the most order focused one. So that was you have no other choice, but you must continue. So that prompt, if it was just measuring obedience, it, was, it would be suggested that that prompt would be the most successful because if we were blindly obe obeying, the order one would seems to be more kind of fitting in with that. Um, but actually the, the experiment focused one and the science focused one was actually the most successful, which furthers that suggestion that maybe there was an already a shared ideology that pursuing science was important and that prompt tapped into that. So that kind of shared ideology with the experimenter and potentially the participant as well. Um, so this all kind of suggests that it's not just blind obedience um, of the orders itself that pe led people to deliver to kind of the 450 volts of shocks, but rather their decisions were kind of more nuanced and dependent on internal factors as well. Their ideologies, how much they could relate and identify with the experiment and the experimenter. Um, and this is, again, kind of further supported uh, and suggested by the fact that when Milgram moved his experiment to Rundell offices, as opposed to the academic giant Yale, um, obedience significantly dropped. Uh, so it, this kind of taps into that idea that it's harder to suggest that you're f doing something great and f furthering science when you're in a rundown office building as opposed to this academic giant Yale. So all of this is to say that it's important to consider the fact that it's not just blind obedience and it may be that Milgram's study doesn't just portray the effect of blind obedience but also maybe some internal factors are going on and we should control those variables in future studies. So why does Milgram's experiment maintain such a powerful hold on our imaginations even decades after the fact? Why am I doing this, these videos on it? Um, so Gina Perry, as mentioned earlier on in this video, she suggests that despite all of its ethical issues, its methodological issues, the fact that we can never really truly replicate Milgram's experiment in order to test its conclusions, um, the study has taken on a role which she calls a powerful parable. Um, and this is kind of saying that Milgram's work might not hold the answers to which uh, to what makes people obey and to the degree in which they might obey. It has, however, inspired other researchers to que to raise these questions, to explore what, what makes people follow orders uh, and perhaps more importantly, what makes people question authority and potentially atrocious orders. So this is kind of all to say that Milgram's study, while it has a lot of its flaws, it is a very, very kind of staple study in psychology and it's important to recognise all of the other studies, the potentially much better methodologically ethical studies, um, it has inspired that so it's still important to recognise that. Um, so thank you for watching my video on Milgram, um, I'm hoping to do some more kind of classic psychology studies uh, so let me know in the comments if there's any ones that you particularly want us or anyone at Private Therapy Clinic to do. Mm -hmm.